Mike Minerni, Suai Panikeum, Parliament of World Religions, Iverunike, Nurubi. I welcome you on behalf of my Ute people to Ute country, Utah. When the Spaniards came here in the 1600s looking for a route to the west coast, they called our people Utah. So that's what they named the state when it came time to name it after our Ute people. We'd like to welcome you here. Hope you enjoy your stay and have a good time here on our homelands. All these tribes you see behind us, we occupy this area. So we we'll all welcome you here. In a minute, our Go Shoot leader will come forward and talk to you. Right now, I'd like to say a little prayer for all of us, that we have a good time here. It's awesome that we get to all the spiritual people come together as one. Nanama is what we say to have all our prayers come together for the world. All of the things that are happening in the Four East, we pray for those, that things will work out. And it's good again to have you here. You make all good things possible. We're grateful for this day that we could all come together as one. The way I was one of my goodness, I hope. Still, the Gosu Josoni, even by name on the Mondanus and Rikum Namagari of Vidinica. Ah, we are now Marvel Miago, Sikimagari of Vidican, Tani Morris again, no more nursing day again. Look away, look away, stick him so over again. No in the sick area, so good morning, whips a mamma or whips a mamagari to over Rocon, excuse me. Good evening. My name is Rupert Steele, and I want to say a short prayer for us. Father God, Father Jesus, we thank you for bringing us all here together tonight in a good way so we could all meet each other and pray for each other and we'll pray for our water here, the most precious, most sacred thing that we have here in Mother Earth, and pray for our Mother Earth Pray for everybody that's here on there, poor, poor legged, our poor legged brothers, our winged, winged brothers, the grass, everything that's here on Mother Earth. We, we need to have us live in harmony with each and every one of those things that we have out here. And I just want to say this in your holy name, amen.
पीस सलाम शलाम माय नेम इज अब्दुल मलिक मुजाहिद एंड आई एम चेयर ऑफ द बोर्ड ऑफ द पार्लियामेंट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड रिलीजन्स वेलकम 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 with the permission of the great indigenous people of this land who are the original owner of this place on behalf of the board of the parliament of the world religions with love in my heart and compassion in my mind and a smile on our faces to reclaim the heart of our humanity i declare this sixth parliament of the world's religion open can find this song on the 28th 8th page of your commitment book I and the woman Mary Lou Prince who is sitting at the piano wrote this song for you crossing in the night long for those they left behind fathers crossing on the sea
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the mercy giving. Dear sisters and brothers, this is our time. Are you with me? This is our time. The world is coming closer in the global village. Let's bring hearts and minds together and closer. That is the interfaith movement. Our actions speak louder, even if the media has difficulty hearing them. Whether it is after the Asian tsunami in Bandiyasha, Indonesia, or it's on the southern tip of India, or if it in our own New Orleans after Katrina. These are the people of faith and interfaith working with each other who stand up to help people before government arrive and way after government has left. Are you with me? That is interfaith. Just last week, armed hate mongers demonstrated in 20 cities across America against the Muslim community. Guess what? Who outnumbered them? People of faith and people of love and people of interfaith. They were in larger numbers. That is interfaith. The parliament has been ahead of its time and always it has been the case. Always inclusive, always encouraging the understanding of the other, always humanizing the other, 
always welcoming the other. I have attended all the parliaments. Well, maybe not the 1893 one. <laughs> not because of what you think, but because nobody tweeted about it. <laughs> now, this is the first parliament being tweeted. But remember the person who stood 123 years ago and said, dear sisters and brothers of America, remember him? People did not wait for his speech. They started claiming as soon as they did, sisters and brothers of America. At that time, there were 19 women speakers. And I heard some voices, you are right and stay with me. In this parliament, majority of these speakers are women speakers. <laughs> parliament mission has always been simple, to cul cultivate harmony among the world's religions and spiritual communities. Why? To foster their engagement with the world and its guiding institutions to achieve a just, peaceful, and sustainable world. As we gather here in this great city of Salt Lake, we hear steps of the refugees on the beaches of Greece. 60 million of those people, much more, many more than World War II. As we gather here, we see the world is in turmoil. But I like to delete that word, turmoil. The world is in a struggle. My dear sisters and brothers of interfaith, the world is in a struggle for peace and justice. And guess who leads the movement of faith and peace and justice? That's the interfaith people. Are you with me? <laughs> dear sisters and brothers of America, as we gather here today in the historic land of the indigenous people, I wonder if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would ask us why his dreams are turning once again into nightmare. A dream in which America is not number one in packing its prisons with its poor and these strangers. Sisters and brothers, let us not turn against each other. Let us not detain our undocumented workers and children in the, in the hurting sand of Arizona. Are you with me? We must learn, we must learn, we must learn the forgotten lesson, lesson about being your brother's keeper. And yes, the lesson from Muhammad, peace be upon him, who said, none of you has faith until you love for your neighbor what you love for your faith. Is it that interfaith? Are you with me? So whether it is the white children, black children, or another godly mix of beautiful creation of God, let us all children grow up learning that diversity is as beautiful as we ourselves. Let us be better neighbors. Let us be better neighbors in this global village where two billion people live around dollar a day. They need bread, not bombs. Are you with me? Let us engage the world. Let us engage the media. Let us engage the guiding institution. Let us work together for a better world, a world with peace, justice, a world which is sustainable. Let us consume less and share more. Are you with me? I am with you, brothers and sisters. Let's march together. Let's work together. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for opening your heart. And thank you all the indigenous people for your love. Thank you. My goodness, our hearts are overwhelmed with love and gratitude 
for the stirring vision that Imam Mujahid has given us to reclaim the heart of humanity and to inspire people everywhere to work together with compassion to build a world of peace, justice, and sustainability. Thank you, Imam. I wish for a moment that you could be where I am and you could see yourselves and feel the sense of overwhelming gratitude and admiration we have for your devotion to this process of reclaiming the heart of humanity. But I'll just have to feel it all by myself. <laughs> My name is Robert Henderson, and I serve as a member of the Board of Trustees for the Council for the Parliament of the World's Religions. And I am a member of the Baha'i Faith And I am delighted to serve as one of your co-hosts this evening. Uh, but before I introduce my partner, I just want to uh, express one more note of gratitude and admiration. And that is for the friends, uh, the members of the Utah tribe that rallied our spirits and galvanized us in a unified mission in service to humanity. And now it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Derek Harkin, who is a senior vice president of the Union Theological Seminary and a, an American Baptist. I'm not quite sure if when Bob mentioned that I was a Baptist preacher, some of you got worried given that this looks a lot like a pulpit and there are a lot of you out there, but we will move the evening on. Let me just say this. Um, we are truly blessed by the, the power, what a momentous and beautiful moment this is. Um, I have to say this. I wasn't going to, but I must. Uh, just prior to moving back to New York City, where I now reside with my family, I lived for a number of years in the nation's capital. And I was proud before tonight that I have not uttered the name of the football franchise that happens to be in that part of the world. I am overwhelmingly thankful that I will never utter that name. What power and beauty we saw expressed by the Utah people this evening. And as we proceed, let me also extend our thanks to Mary Lou Prince, who rendered a profoundly beautiful anthem just a moment ago. Mary Lou Prince is the composer of three symphonies, a chamber opera, two cantatas, choral and chamber music, solo and vocal and instrumental music, we are truly thankful that she was able to grace this stage with her presence on this evening. Once again, give yourselves a round of applause. Give this moment the adulation that it deserves. Well, friends, we have a lot to be thankful for this evening. And one of our deepest depths of gratitude is that we have the honor and the privilege of hosting the governor of the state of Utah, Governor Gary Herbert. And I just want to, I just want to mention that you know that Governor Herbert is a tireless champion of economic development in Utah and led the state's economic recovery, recovery in the wake of the Great Dis uh, Recession. But his message tonight is one of social and spiritual leadership. 
And it is in that spirit that we welcome the Governor of the State of Utah, Governor Gary Herbert. Well, thank you, Bob, and thank you all for being here. As governor of the great state of Utah, it's indeed my pleasure and privilege to welcome you here to Salt Lake City, Utah, and welcome the Parliament of World Religions here today. Uh, I hope you feel welcome. You are welcome. We're honored to have you here. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I would say on behalf of the people of Utah and our own history here as Utahns, that the World Parliament of Religions and uh, the people of Utah are a good fit. Almost 170 years ago, early Mormon pioneers and others came into this valley looking for some peace and the ability to worship as they saw fit. They fled persecution, they came to these mountain valleys, and they said taking a scripture out of the Old Testament in Isaiah will make this desert valley blossom as a rose with a spirit of cooperation, a faith in a benevolent God, and hard work, you can see the results of that effort today. Utah has become, over time, a home for a wide variety of faiths. Not just Mormons, but we have other Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Jews, just to name a number of the faiths that we find here in the great state of Utah. They're welcomed here, they are a part of our fabric, and a great part of the success that we call Utah today. Their contribution has been many and welcome. As I see the World Parliament of Religions here, as we host approximately 9,500 people from over 70 countries from around the world, representing probably 40 or 50 different religions, I see this as an example of what the world can do in coming together in peace and harmony. I appreciate the work of people of faith in trying to, in fact, make the world a better place. I appreciate the vision of the Parliament of World uh, Religions in their vision statement where they say this, the vision of the Parliament of World Religions is of a just, peaceful and sustainable world in which religious and spiritual communities live in harmony and contribute to a better world from their riches of wisdom and compassion. As I look as a politician involved on a national stage with our National Governors of Association, I see that uh, the ongoing conflicts we have in this country and around the world, there is not harmony that we would like to have here. It's in short supply, and I say that harmony is needed more now than ever in the world before us. Clearly, <laughs> clearly the world's religions have a role to play in achieving that goal. While there's been some abuses with religion in our historical past, uh, the abundance of goodwill of hope and faith that's been brought to us by religion, improving people's lives and communities, instilling good and noble values in each of us, and moving us to action is what religion is all about. The ability to establish schools and universities, building hospitals, comforting the sick and afflicted, feeding and clothing the poor, and bringing solace and hope to countless people are just the few things that you were all about. Unfortunately, sometimes those acts of goodness go unnoticed. Sometimes what we see in the media are just the uh, bad sides of life, and we know that sometimes good news doesn't sell where bad news does. Even so, communities of faith, in fact, must press on. We sure have differences in doctrines and difference in our religious practices, but I would say to all of us, we have much more in common than we have in differences. Religion must play an indispensable part in establishing harmony and uplifting humanity. Nobody said it was going to be easy, but it certainly is rewarding 
and it is absolutely essential for the world's future. George Washington, the father of our country here in the United States, said this, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And let us, with caution, indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. We maintain that morality is not by just what we say, but more importantly, by what we do through service. As Mahatma Gandhi said, happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. There is much that we can do together. It is time for us, to, in fact, to come together, find ways to work together to uplift people's lives and improve our communities around the world. We cannot work alone. I think that becomes weak. But working together, we can become strong. And in harmony, there are no limits to the good that we can accomplish. As a man of faith, myself, who believes in a loving God, who we are all children of, therefore making us brothers and sisters, we should be able to work together to improve the lives of all mankind. And I pray and I hope that God will bless us in this very sacred and noble endeavor. May peace and harmony abide with us all in this effort. I thank you for your efforts, for your faith and prayers, and welcome to Utah. Let me next call to the lectern Fahad Abul Nasser. He is uh, one who has many years of experience in founding and guiding successful nonprofits and think tanks. He chaired the founding committee and successfully established the Al Agar Group, an independent think tank in Saudi Arabia. We're thankful for those who implement the work that we all advocate. Fahad Abu Al Nasser. Governor Herbert, Imam Malik, Excellencies, esteemed religious leaders, interfaith leaders, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of our Secretary General, Mr. Faisal bin Muammar, it's a great honor to be here with you today representing the International Dialogue Center, Kaisid. We are the only intergovernmental organization governed by religious representatives. Seeing this impressive assembly, I am e deeply aware of the great debt our organization owes to the pioneering leaders who made dialogue among religions a reality. Many of these leaders are here with us today. Many of you have committed your lives to promoting dialogue and cooperation. We share a common bond to build lasting bridges between religions and cultures. Your movement, your movement, our movement, the interfaith movement, is rich, diverse, and inclusive. It combines the strength of different organizations, different methods, different philosophies. At the International Dialogue Center, we too embrace diversity as a gift, and we see dialogue as an opportunity to bring about sustainable, positive change. Kassid was founded in 2012 by the Republic of Austria, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Spain, and the Holy See as the founding observer. For an intergovernmental organization, our governance is unique. Our board of directors include nine representatives of five of the world religious tradition, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism. The board design and supervise all of our programs. 
This structure gives us a unique ability to bring together politics and religion. As you know, the dialogue between policymakers and religious leaders is essential for building sustainable peace. Our programs create a space for this dialogue in conflict areas and around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, my message to you today is this. Kaseed programs and training support the work you do. We want to partner with you and to complement your good work. Our goal is to amplify your voices and advocate dialogue for building peace. As you are all aware, religious identities are being manipulated by certain political and religious leaders who abuse religious teachings and values to incite violence. These growing conflicts threaten peaceful coexistence, and for that reason, now dialogue is needed more than ever. Allow me to give you a few examples. Our international fellow program trained the next generation of religious leaders in dialogue and peace building. Through social media training, we are helping dialogue practitioners to challenge voices of hatred and division. The growing refugee crisis in the Middle East and in Europe tells us that we must urgently use dialogue for peace. Kaisid Initiative, united against violence in the name of religion, is, is fostering dialogue and cooperation between religious leaders and governments, particularly in Iraq and Syria. It began in November 2014 when we gathered leaders of Christian, Muslim, and other religious and ethnic communities from the Arab world. And with one voice, they denounced any violence in the name of religion. Since then, this initiative has grown. Peace is being built today at the local level through religious communities. Kaisid bring religious leaders and policymakers together in dialogue. Political leaders need the wisdom and the commitment of religious communities to transform conflict and enable reconciliation. In the Central African Republic, for instance, a country torn by war, we we are helping religious communities and civil societies acquire an active role in rebuilding the country. We are building platforms for dialogue experts in Nigeria, Iraq, and the Central African Republic to directly engage with key political and religious figures. Here, at this historic parliament session, we hope to learn from you. We hope you will take the opportunity to visit us at our booth and exchange your experience with us. Let us join efforts to promote dialogue and reconciliation throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Abu al Nassar. And now to offer a welcome and prayer is Elder Whitney Clayton who was sustained as a member of the first quorum of the 70 of the Church of, the, of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints on March 31st, 2001. Please help me welcome Elder Clayton. Good evening. As a resident of Utah and a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to welcome you to Utah. We're glad to see you here. Thank you for coming. We're aware that your trip coming for this meeting of the Parliament of the World's Religions was easier than it was for the pioneers who came many years ago. Today we come by airplane, or by car, or by train. In those days, they came on foot, in carts, and by horseback. There is a rugged mountain range to the east 
and a desert to the west. The winters are difficult and the summers are hot. But the people who came here to settle this land came in a desire to find peace and to practice their religion without interference. They faced insurmountable odds, but as Governor Herbert has acknowledged this evening already, look what was accomplished. We're delighted to welcome you to this beautiful city that we call home. Salt Lake City is greatly benefited by the influence of a number of churches and faiths. We are grateful for the presence of all. The combination enriches society and enriches our community. And we welcome you here in that very same spirit. We're glad to see you. As this conference unfolds, I hope you'll each take a moment to recognize and be grateful for the privilege that we have to gather so many different faiths in one place in safety and in peace. Indeed, we hope. We hope that this can be a pattern everywhere and for all people. This Parliament of the World's Religions is a great opportunity to reflect on our shared commitment to improving the lot of humankind. As we stand for the value of faith and work to build strong interfaith relationships, we not only bless ourselves and our families, we bless our congregations and our communities. Music has always played a significant role in our faith. Many of you are acquainted with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Every Sunday morning, the choir has a nationwide broadcast, a radio broadcast and television as well. It's the longest continuous radio broadcast in the United States. It begins every Sunday morning at 9.30 in the Tabernacle on Temple Square, located about a five minute walk north and east of here. We invite you to attend if you're responsibilities with the parliament don't interfere with your ability to do that. You need to be seated by nine o'clock. The choir has prepared several numbers to sing for you after the broadcast ends at 10 that are prepared especially for you. We hope you'll enjoy them. We also want to mention We also want to mention that in the Tabernacle on Temple Square on Sunday evening, there will be a performance of sacred music on an interfaith basis that has been prepared by a number of people living here in the Salt Lake Valley. That musical event, again, is just a five minute walk from here and it begins at 6.30 p.m. Again, we welcome you to our beautiful city. We're glad you're here and hope that you will feel welcome and happy while you're here. And we hope that you'll leave recommitted to working together in harmony to bless and help each other as we travel through life. I've been asked to offer a prayer according to the, the tradition of which I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and ask you then to join me in prayer. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, as thy children here gathered tonight, we invite thy Holy Spirit in thy presence. May this Parliament lead to greater peace and understanding. May it build fellowship and goodwill. May all of us who participate here together be blessed to feel increased love for all with whom we may meet anywhere and at any time. We are grateful for this occasion and grateful for the safety and circumstances in which we meet and invite thy spirit and presence in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you very much.
Over the expanse of his career, Rabbi David Saperstein has been a tireless advocate for social justice and human dignity. Uh, Rabbi Saperstein is an attorney, and presently he serves as the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom and is the first non Christian to hold that post. Please welcome Rabbi David Saperstein. Good to be back and once again to be part of this opening program to set the themes for our gathering. What an exhilarating experience it is to witness this magnificent celebration in which each of you could see it from up here, this luminous tapestry of religions and cultures and nationalities, the unmatchable opportunity to hear from some of the great teachers of our time, some of the most inspiring leaders and to gather with friends from across the globe, we all too rarely have the opportunity to be with. To use the biblical phrase, truly, kosi rivaya, my cup runneth over. What a challenge in a short time to address this year's declarations, raising up the rights of women, emerging leaders, and indigenous peoples, speaking out against hate and violence, addressing income inequality and climate change. All deserve the close attention and immediate action they will receive in the coming days. And while many things have changed in the five years since we last gathered, unfortunate patterns remain. Across the globe, we see governments, societies, non-state actors, and yes, some in the name of religion, intensify their practices of hate in speech and action on the streets of our cities and in countries near and far. We see those who resort to violence, conflict and terror as a way of resolving differences and achieving domination over others. So too we see the structural legal and economic injustice and inequities that still plague too many places in the globe and take such a human toll day after day. Well, we are gathered here because one of humanity's most effective antidotes is the power and effectiveness of the interfaith communities of the world working together. You are here because you know and represent that power. You are here because we all recognize that while we all have challenges we must face on our own, within our own faith communities, when we can work together in our vast numbers, we can achieve things none of us can achieve alone. When we act together effectively, it can be a geometric increase in what we do singly. In our engagement and openness to hear and learn from each other, we enrich ourselves learning about others, including those with whom our lack of understanding had long bred mistrust and alienation. Yet paradoxically, in such exchanges where we must explain clearly our own traditions to others, test our long-held assumptions by new perspectives that we encounter in others, we deepen and sharpen our understanding of our own faith traditions. And perhaps most importantly at this moment in history, in the very act of meeting, sharing, dialoguing, working together to bridge divides and enhance cooperation, we are modeling the kind of world of which we dream and which we strive to create. I am so inspired by the focus on women in this gathering. Of Of course, across the world, there remain scores of millions of young girls who lack access to primary education. Who knows, the doctors, the scholars and scientists, the communal leaders, poets and religious leaders whose manifold, manifold gifts are lost to those girls and to us when their potential is thwarted by lack of education. Yeah. 
Worldwide, almost two-thirds of illiterate adults are women. In sub-Saharan Africa, less than one-third of poor girls in rural areas were completing primary education. As Nick Kristof points out, these dismal statistics are at odds with their impact. The yields from investing in girls' education are substantial. An educated girl is likely to increase her personal learning potential as well as reduce poverty in her community. The effects carry from one generation to the next. For educated girls, in turn, have healthier and better educated children. The extremist Muslim group Boko Haram kidnapped more than 250 mostly Christian teenage girls from their high school dormitory shattering their dreams and their lives. So too, Malala Yousafzai was shot by extremists in Pakistan simply for championing the right of girls to education. These attacks are part of a global backlash against girls' education by extremists and against the potential of the women that they become. We are fanatic, we are fanatics. Why are fanatics so afraid of girls' education? Again, as Christoph puts it, because there is no force more powerful to transform a society. The greatest threat to extremism isn't drones firing missiles, but girls reading books. And of, well, to you too. And of course, you know the statistics, each and every one of you of global poverty. Well, we are making progress every year and embrace the Sustainable Development Goals is central to our efforts. Still, over one-third one third of the world's population, more than two billion people, live, less than, live on less than $2.50 a day. More than nearly a billion live in extreme poverty, less than a dollar and a half a day. One billion children worldwide are living in poverty. According to UNICEF, 22,000 children die from causes due to poverty every single day. Preventable diseases like diarrhea and pneumonia take the lives of two million children a year who are too poor to afford proper treatment. Indeed, it is the children, it is the children who living in poverty displaced from homes to refugee camps, caught in the midst of violent conflict. It is far too often the children who die first. In the global refugee crisis from Southeast Asia to Africa to Syria pricked the conscience of all good people. Who among us will ever forget the image of three-year-old Alam Kurde? lying dead on a Turkish beach. His five-year-old brother, Galip, his mother, Anne, perishing nearby. Indeed, we must not, we dare not stand by the blood of even a single child more. Not now, not ever again, not in the refugee camps, not on the streets of our cities, not those trafficked in brothels or sweatshops of nations across the globe. We must speak out for and with them in voices so powerful and determined they cannot be ignored. The Nobel Prize winning poet Nellie Sachs, a German Jewish refugee who fled Nazi persecution, wrote of the Holocaust in words that speak across the decades to us at this moment of global history. O night of the weeping children, O night of the children branded for death, sleep may not enter here. 
terrible nursemaids have usurped the place of mothers. Instead of mother's milk, panic suckles the little ones. Just yesterday, mother still drew sleep toward them like a white moon. There was a doll with cheeks derouged by kisses. In one arm, the stuffed pet already brought to life by love, and in the other, now blows the wind of dying, blows the shifts over the hair that no one will ever comb again. My friends, not one more. <laughs> As Pope Francis has powerfully and eloquently and urgently challenged all of us, perhaps the most intuitively religious of the great social issues of our day is the challenge to the environment, to God's creation. Think of all the mosques, temples, ashrams, churches, synagogues, other houses of worship, whatever they may be called in your very traditions of how many there are, millions of them stretch across the globe. Think of what we are capable of doing, acting together. For most indigenous peoples have always lived and spoken powerfully on behalf of the natural world that sustains us all. And for those of us in the Abrahamic tradition, the foundation of such care is clear. We know why we must be involved. The earth is the eternals and the fullness thereof. What we own, we own in a trust relationship with God, requiring that we protect God's creation. But the urgency of today's crisis challenges our ability to live out those values. For our generation will be marked as the first to see our planet home, the first to really see it. Indeed, the picture of the whole Earth taken from outer space is the defining image, the icon, the revelation of our new generation. No other humans before us ever experienced this phenomenon. And as we see it from afar, this blue-green home with its great forests and seas, mountains and creatures. It is sweet and precious and good the way God created and beheld it in Genesis. Ki tov, and it was good. But just at the very moment in human history, when we see with clarity and wonder and with awe how precious is God's creation, we are suddenly confronted by startling evidence of its peril of damage already being wrought by our own hands, by our greed, by our ignorance, by our indifference, affecting all of us indiscriminately. Global warming, ozone depletion, melting ice caps, melted faster in the last 20 years than in the last 10,000 before it, rising sea levels, the escalating eradication of entire species of life, destruction of our rainforests, escalating world population. Numerous studies show it is advancing far faster than pessimists predicted even two decades ago. Whatever our experience in the particular locale we live in, 2014 was at the global level the warmest year on record, and NASA and NOAA tell us that 2015 is even warmer. Barring dramatic action, we are approaching a series of tipping points that will bring cascading changes, causing permanent catastrophic damage, and I, like each and every one of you, feel this personally, for this is my home. Everyone I have ever loved lived or lives here, and every grandchild and child of yours and mine will inherit this home however we leave it. We must not betray God's trust in us, nor those of the generations yet to come. And finally, our ability to address any of these issues as religious communities and in interfaith coalition depends on the freedom to act in accordance with our religious conscience. 
Indeed, religious freedom is bound up with addressing almost every urgent issue we face. You cannot counter violent extremism and confront terrorism done in the name of religion if we lack the freedom to do so and if societies are torn apart by sectarian violence. You cannot have the stability that is a sine qua non, the essential requirement to build democracy to resolve conflicts, to engage in providing the indispensable social services that religious communities provide worldwide, helping hundreds of millions if we lack the freedom to do so. And if people who are oppressed religious groups do not believe that they can live within the system in accordance with their religious conscience, then that becomes fertile fields for extremists to convince them that they should follow them in a violent effort to overturn the system. When we see historic Christians, Yazidis and other communities in Iraq and Syria being devastated, when we see Baha'is in Iran, Tibetan Buddhists in China, Shia Muslims in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, Rohingya Muslims in Burma, I um, mean, indigenous peoples in so many countries across the globe, all victims of governmental or societal discrimination, harassment, persecution, physical attacks, sexual violence, enslavement. We above all, we above all must not be silent. Sadly, this list is far from exhaustive, but shows a broad range of the serious threats to religious freedom and religious communities in nearly every corner of the globe. Just yesterday, as many of you know, the International Religious Freedom Office at the State Department, I am so honored to run, released its annual report on the status of religious freedom in 199 countries, including yours. Look it up. Yet across the globe, with all of these problems, courageous, brave religious leaders, often in interfaith groupings, put their lives on the line to stand up to violence, to stand up to hatred, to stand between those who would persecute, those who would attack, and their victims. God bless them in Burma, in Nigeria, in France, in Europe, those who surrounded the synagogue that was attacked and someone killed in Copenhagen to allow worship to continue safely in Pakistan, in Sudan, I can regale you with things that would make you so proud of the bravery, the vision, the courage of people. And I have to say, except in the most repressive of the countries, even those who do have repressive policies and discriminatory policies, as I travel across the globe, the churches, the mosques, the temples are bursting with religious fervor. People are filling them with their prayers and their hopes and their families, often young families. It is truly inspiring to know the people's determination and courage in living out their lives. To the righteous, to the, to the religiously oppressed in every land who live in fear, afraid to speak of what they believe in, who worship in underground churches, mosques, or temples, lest authorities discover and punish their devotion to an authority beyond the state, who languish in prisons, bodies tortured, spirits too often disfigured, simply because they love God in their own way or question the existence of God, who feel so desperate that they are forced to flee their homes to avoid being killed and because of persecution, beyond the account of their faith, for all of them, let us act with courage and determination in such a way that we will be a shining beacon of hope and light for freedom all across the globe. There, there is a teaching from a strand of my own tradition that maintains that when God created the universe, God chose to leave one part of creation undone, the creation of a world of justice and peace. To complete that creation, God gave to humanity, to each one of you and to me, to every human being on earth, that given to nothing else, the ability to understand and choose between good and evil, 
the blessing and the curse, a name God entrusted to us in our sacred texts, a common blueprint for how to build that world of justice and peace in calling us to be partners with God in the completion of creation, in enabling us to do God's work here on earth, God has ennobled humanity, raised us above mere biological existence, and given to our lives meaning and destiny and purpose. For those of God's children in peril today, we must act now. But for all of humanity, for all the generations yet to come, we must address these challenges for the long run as well. And if we do, this I promise you, with all of our past mistakes and daunting challenges, we are not the prisoners of a bitter and unremitting past. Rather, we can be, we will be, no, we must be the shapers of a better and more hopeful future for all God's children. As Dr. King said, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. The work that all of you do every day is bending that arc. So go forward with confidence together. For ours, yours, is an awesome agenda, an agenda of justice and peace for all. Let it be fulfilled. Together we can smash limitations and transcend challenges until we have made the kind of world all of our children deserve. May that bending of the art that takes place here be the blessing of this great gathering, and may it ever be the blessing of your lives. Thank you. Rabbi Saperstein, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for inspiring us with such a clear vision and sense of urgency, and for defining the elements of this just, peaceful, and sustainable world we want to build. And I especially want to thank you for focusing significant comments on the indispensable role of women and girls in the transformation of the spiritual and social condition of society. And Rabbi, I just want to add one other element and just a vision. In the Baha'i writings, there is a passage that says that we must view the world of humanity as a bird. One wing of that bird is man, and the other one, wing of the bird is women. And both wings have to, got to be equally strong and empowered for the bird of humanity to fly. Okay. And so, Rabbi, we're going to have a series of prayers offered by friends of faith from all over the world praying to God that this vision be hastened. We will be joined by Swami Suhitananda, the Venerable Dharma Master Shintao, and Judith Longin, followed by Adama Dieng, Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb, and Acharya Lakeshi Muni. I take this opportunity to offer my respectful greetings to the children of one universal God who is manifesting himself through different religions and faiths of the world. The Americans organized 
in 1893, the Parliament of Religions, to find out a common voice amongst the different religions of the world. Swami Vivekananda contributed to a great extent to this effort. Afterwards, the drive went into obscurity. Again, a team of volunteers belonging to different faiths came forward in 1993 to launch such a platform, and we are today here owing to their noble attempt. First of all, I convey my thanks to the organizers on behalf of all present here representing different faiths of the world. I have been allotted only two minutes' time, so I shall have to just make it brief as, fast as possible. Swami Vivekananda, I would finish my talk because two minutes is enough. Swami Vivekananda, in 1893, he pronounced some words which I feel is relevant even today. I am quoting from Swami Vivekananda, upon the banner of error religion will soon be written in spite of resistance, hell and not fight, assimilation and not destruction, harmony and peace and not dissension. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank你们非常感谢主办单位给我们这个机会。那现在我就做祈祷。此刻世界有很多的混乱和不安，战争、冲突、宗教盛极和环境的破坏，消费主义对我们的伤害很大。We want to thank the organizers to give us this opportunity, and now we want to pray all together. This world of ours is so much presently marked by unrest, conflicts, wars, the destruction of sacred sites and of the environment, unbridled consumerism. All of this is causing harm to all of us. <laughs> For the advent of peace, let us sow the peace of let us sow the seeds of peace together. And let us rediscover the sacredness of the earth. All of us form one interconnected, diverse body of life. And we are responsible for its protection. Let us start from all encompassing love, without any distinction of race or person. Let us discover the path to peace and coexistence through interfaith dialogue and through loving cooperation. Let us 
，都能够呢重新建立与大地的连结。祈愿对未来感到彷徨不安的青年，都能够确立生命的轨迹跟志愿。祈愿世界各角落的呃纯子孤儿，都能够受到良好的教育和照顾。祈愿来自不同的族群、文化的妇女都能够发挥慈善，啊，起造生命的和谐。呃，让我们共同努力，合力守护，爱地球，爱平安。祈愿我们的祝福大家，心和平，世界就和平。Let us pray for all those who suffer in this world, the countless refugees, that they may find shelter and a new life. The, uh, the indigenous people who have lost their roots, that they may reconnect with the earth and teach us to do the same. Let us pray for the disoriented youth who see no hope in the future that they might find their vocation in life and joy a path to healing. Let us pray for so many orphans, innocent children with no chance, that they may find help and the education and the care that they deserve. Let us pray for the women from all cultures and races, that their wisdom will show us a way to harmony in this world. Let us all work together to make this our home, one global family. I come here this evening representing the Faiths in the World Committee of the Catholic Association of Diocesan Ecumenical Officers, and I am grateful and humbled to be in your presence. At the end of Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment, he crafted two prayers related to creation. I want to share with you this evening the prayer for Christians in union with creation as a way of uh, sharing how we Christians pray and also perhaps a way of seeing how Pope Francis is seeing creation. Father, we praise you with all your creatures. They came forth from your all-powerful hand. They are yours, filled with your presence and your tender love. Praise be to you. Son of God, Jesus, through you all things were made. You were formed in the womb of Mary, our mother. You became part of this earth, and you gazed upon this world with human eyes. Today, you are alive in every creature in your risen glory. Praise be to you. Holy Spirit, by your light, you guide this world towards the Father's love and accompany creation as it groans in travail. You also dwell in our hearts and you inspire us to do what is good. Praise be to you. Triune Lord, wondrous community of infinite love, teach us to contemplate you in the beauty of the universe for all things speak of you. Awaken our praise and thankfulness for every being that you have made. Give us the grace you feel profoundly joined to everything that is. God of love, show us our place in this world as channels of your love for all the creatures of this earth for not one of them is forgotten in your sight. Enlighten those who possess money and power that they may avoid the sin of indifference, that they may love the common good, advance the weak, and care for this world in which we live. 
The poor and the earth are crying out. O Lord, seize us with your power and light. Help us to protect all life, to prepare us for a better future, for the coming of your kingdom of justice, peace, love, and beauty. Praise be to you. Good evening. I should say that tonight I'm the voice of the United Nations. And it is no surprise that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who wanted to be here today, but unfortunately due to conflict in schedule, he couldn't make it. He asked me to come and deliver his greetings. But he chose me to come because my office has been mobilizing these recent times, religious leaders, group faith organizations around the world to call on them to contribute in preventing incitement to violence that could lead to atrocity crimes. We had a meeting in Fez, Morocco, the Global Forum, followed by recently the regional forum in Treviso, Italy. The next one will be in Amman, 10, 11th November, and we will have another meeting in Washington, in Asia and Africa. And that is why I feel extremely humble to address such large gathering of religious leaders and group faith organization. And now let me give you the message of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. I'm pleased to convey my greetings to all those taking part in the 2015 Parliament of World's Religion. I know you may come from different religious traditions, but you have a shared faith in humanity that is the spirit that brings you to Salt Lake City. We are living through a time of turbulence, tension, and transition. Societies are more diverse, but intolerance is on the rise. We see growing and violent extremism, radicalism, and widening conflict that are characterized by a fundamental disregard for human life. We see heightened hostility and discrimination towards people crossing borders in search of safety or opportunities denied to them at home. Hate crimes and other forms of intolerance mar too many communities, often stuck by irresponsible leaders seeking political gain. I strongly believe in engaging with religious leaders because of your profound influence in your communities and your commitment to dignity and mutual respect. I have long championed interfaith dialogue and met with many faith leaders because I know we have much to gain from your moral leadership. We are a more connected world thanks to technology. But we can only be a more united world through efforts like yours to reach out, find common ground, and work for shared solution for our shared humanity. Last month, world leaders adopted the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. It is a people-centric, planet-friendly blueprint to end poverty and leave no one behind. I, I urge you to take these goals, these global goals, and work together with us to help make them a reality in your communities and the wider 
global community. As we seek to tackle peace, development, and human rights challenges around the world, I thank you for your engagement, and I look forward to strengthening our common efforts to build a sustainable world and a life of dignity and social justice for all. I thank you. बहनों और भाइयों मैं उस भारत देश से आया हूं जहां से 1893 में स्वामी विवेकानंद ने विश्व धर्म संसद को संबोधित किया था मैं उस जैन धर्म की प्रार्थना प्रस्तुत करने के लिए उपस्थित हूं जिसका 1893 में प्रतिनिधित्व किया था श्री वीरचंद राघव जी गांधी ने मैं उस जैन धर्म के भगवान महावीर की अहिंसा के संदेश को क्योंकि आज समूची दुनिया को अहिंसा अनेकांत और अपरिग्रह के दर्शन की आवश्यकता है अनुब्रह्म का मुकाबला अहिंसा से किया जा सकता है अहिंसा से ही विश्व शांति का सपना साकार हो सकता है इसलिए मैं भगवान महावीर के उस अहिंसा के संदेश को अहिंसा की प्रार्थना को आपके सामने प्रस्तुत कर रहा हूं नमो अरहंता नमो सिद्धान नमो आयरियाण नमो उवजायाण नमो लोये सब साहूनम ऐसो पंच नमोकारो सब पाव पणासनो मंगलान च सब्य सिंह पड़म हवई मंगलम चारी मंगलम अरहंता मंगलम सिद्धा मंगलम साहु मंगलम केवली पन्नतो धम्मो मंगलम अरहंता लोगुत्तमा सिद्धा लोगुत्तमा साहु लोगुत्तमा केवली पन्नतो धम्मो लोगुत्तमो चारी शरण पवज्जामी अरहंते शरण पवज्जामी सिद्धे शरण पवज्जामी साहु शरण पवज्जामी केवली पन्नतम धम्मम शरण पवज्जामी ओम शांति शांति असलाकुम शलोम अलैम पीस पी विद यू ये वाने बेराशीना ये वाने बेराशीना ये वाने बेराशीना बेम of peace build the house of peace build the house of peace quickly in our day may this story be a prayer once as a woman rabbi that's me i went yes one of the first thank you <laughs> women in leadership speaking about themselves about women in their own voices I was taught by my ancestors that it is not enough to speak but you must also do and so invited by the fellowship of reconciliation I went to Iran and was the first woman rabbi to go to Iran ever and I met the Jewish community there and I also met many many Muslims there and once at Jam Karan where we were praying the men with the men the women with the women we came out the night had fallen upon us and as we were walking out of this beautiful place a young imam said rabbi rabbi and i turned to him he said 
this place is holy to us because it has a well of waters in which the Mahdi appeared. I said, Alhamdulillah. He said, you have a custom like this in Jerusalem. We tie red ribbons on the grill of the well and you put notes in Jerusalem, in the wall in Jerusalem. I said, yes. He said, you know, this place is holy, but it's not intrinsically holy. The whole earth is holy. I said, yes. We say the same, the whole world is holy. Jerusalem isn't intrinsically holy, it belongs to everyone. The whole world is holy. He said, you know, if you harm one human being, quoting Saadi, then you harm the whole. And I quoted the Baal Shem Tov and said, all of us, we are the root of humanity. If we harm one, we harm the whole. And I turned around, I felt something, and I turned around, and behind me were all the worshipers at Jam Karan. There were three, four hundred people listening to a young Shia Imam and a rabbi, myself, speaking these words of peace. And I thought to myself, the words of the Kutzka Rebbe, where is peace? wherever you let peace in. So may it be for us. May there be peace and justice. And I cannot stand here before you without praying that the wounds of the Holocaust and genocide for all people are healed and that there is justice for my cousins, the Palestinian people. May this be... May, may this be the, the year from Ferguson, where Black Lives Matter, to Gaza. May this be the year that we bring down all the walls of separation and make justice happen in our time. Dear friends, we had planned to have a musical interlude at this point, but at the, but at the last moment, I'm afraid that, that is not going to be possible. So we're going to continue with two additional prayers, and they will be offered by Irvad Kobad Zarolia and Lord Indirjit Singh. This is a small prayer from Zoroastrian tradition. Pana me yaza bakshao yande bakshao yazgare maherban ashem maho vaistemasti ustasti Usta aham mai yadashai vahista yashem Hamaz or baad, Hamaz or hamao shobao Hamaz or hamao nekibao Hamaz or hamao 
خاری با اما زور وش کر فی با اما زور کم گنا با اما زور با زرتوستی دین راستیا بکتاری با دینے مازدا یشنی حق تا دوستار با This is our joint prayer of unity, understanding and inner strength. May we live and work in unison with men and women of merit, virtue and above all truth. May we live and work in unison with men and women of merit, virtue, benevolence and goodness. May we live and work in unison with souls in possession of inner light and truth and wisdom. May we live and work in unison with souls whose merit and virtues are ever multiplying. May we live and work in with unison with souls whose demerits and faults are always declining. Yatha zamyaut, yatha afrinami, may our Mazda bless you all. Thank you. I will talk from the Sikh perspective. The Lord first created light. From the Lord's play, all living creatures came, and from the divine light, all creation sprang. Why should we then divide human creatures into the high and low? Brother, be not in error. All creation emanates from the one creator. The Lord's spirit is all pervading. The Lord, the Maker, has molded one mass of clay into vessels of diverse shapes. Free from taint are all the vessels of clay, since free from taint is the divine potter. The allusion to different vessels of clay in the one divine potter reminds us that despite different appearances, we are all equal members of our one human race. This verse or Shabbat taken from the Sikh Holy Scriptures, the Guru Granth Sahib, in many ways encapsulates both the thrust of Sikh teachings and the central theme of this historic parliament in its emphasis on the absurdity of all man-made distinctions of birth, class, or creed. Other verses in the Guru Granth Sahib make clear that this equality extends to full gender equality. Sikhism is one of our different paths towards a summit of understanding of our common responsibility to the Creator to walk, work for the benefit of our fellow human beings. Sikhs believe our different paths are not mutually exclusive but frequently merge to give us both a heightened understanding of our own faith and our common responsibilities. Our gurus emphasize this respect for other ways of life in many different ways. Guru Arjan, the fifth of our 10 founding gurus, incorporated some uplifting verses of Hindu and Muslim poets in the Guru Granth Sahib, including the one I've just read, to show that no one religion has a monopoly of truth and that all faiths should be respected. To promote, <laughs> to, promote this te to promote this reaching out to others, the Guru asked a Muslim saint, a Muslim saint, to lay the foundation stone of the historic the Sahib at Amritsar, commonly known as the Golden Temple. In furthering this world's first major move to interfaith understanding, the Guru placed a door at each of its four sides to signify a welcome from all from any spiritual or geographic direction. The, the ninth Guru, Guru Tegh Bahadur, 
took this further by giving his life defending the rights of the Hindu community to freedom of worship in the face of forced conversion by the then Mughal rulers. In doing so, he gave practical utterance to Voltaire's famous words, I may not believe in what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. I'm delighted. I'm delighted that this parliament has set its goal on the reclaiming of our common humanity. It's a recognition that religion has largely failed to move minds in what Sikhs call a gurmukh or godly direction by making concern for others central to all we do. Instead of recognizing the common thrust of our different faiths, we've set barriers of belief between them, smugly and sometimes violently proclaiming our superiority and exclusive path to God. A failure to give a clear ethical lead centered on compassion and concern for others has led to a society obsessed in searching for contentment through material possessions, creating a selfish society in which the vulnerable suffer. Our common task is then to reclaim the heart of society by working together. To be successful, we must engage with wider society and boldly challenge what are becoming warped norms of putting others before, of putting self before others, and political policies based on narrow-minded self-interest rather than ethical concerns. Sikhs ask as Sikhs ask in our daily prayer, we should make concern for the well-being of all humanity, central to all we do. If we do this, we are bound to be successful in reclaiming the heart of humanity. Thank you. We are already appreciative for the hospitality that has been extended to so many of us from those here in the city of Salt Lake. And it's my privilege now to call upon Mayor Ralph Becker, the mayor of Salt Lake City, to bring remarks. Uh, thank you for gathering here in Salt Lake City. You have brought with you a spirit of community, unity, warmth, and goodwill. As mayor of Salt Lake City, I am honored to welcome each of you to a place that takes pride in welcoming others. I hope you have felt our collective welcoming embrace. It's symbolized by the strength and beauty of the Wasatch and Ochre Mountains that surround us. Thank you to the Parliament leaders for choosing Salt Lake City as the place for this important gathering, for providing a framework for people from diverse cultural, religious, and spiritual traditions to discuss and focus on the things that really matter, our humanity, compassion, peace, justice, and sustainability of the earth. For the next four days, we have the opportunity to learn from each other. We know that our well-being and the well-being of our planet are dependent upon our ability today, tomorrow, and in the future to care for each other, to collaborate, to engage in constructive dialogue, and to find and act upon solutions to our challenges together. The Parliament's Interfaith Council call to action on climate change 
which draws upon statements from great leaders like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Pope Francis, acknowledges that the effects of climate change are real and impose a serious threat globally to our own communities. It encourages us all to commit ourselves to take action and act together as one community. And I will add to those statements a sustainability message from another religious leader, from another generation, a proponent of wise stewardship of ourselves, each other, and our planet, Brigham Young. He said, keep your valley pure. Keep your towns as pure as you possibly can. Keep your hearts pure and labor what you can consistently, but not so as to injure yourselves. Be faithful in your religion. Be full of love and kindness towards each other. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy your time here in Salt Lake City. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, friends, we're delighted to be joined by your county counterpart, Mayor Ben McAdams. I'm Salt Lake County Mayor Ben McAdams, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the more than one million residents of this, the Salt Lake Valley, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2015 Parliament of the World's Religions. We recognize the spirituality, the culture, and the history of our Native Americans whose words, and we thank them for their words and music and ceremony that welcomed us into this hall tonight. Over the next five days, you will be taking on the most critical issues facing the people who share this planet. Climate change, war and violence, income inequality, and human rights and the dignity of women. They cry out for the attention of all nations. It is fitting that this gathering, representing so many different faiths, cultures, and communities, is being held here in Utah. This is the place where members of my faith, the Mormons, found sanctuary and after being persecuted for their religious beliefs in other parts of this country, right here in this Salt Lake Valley. This beautiful valley, against the backdrop of our majestic mountains, continues to welcome today modern day refugees, either those who are fleeing conflicts around the world or just seeking opportunity and a better life for themselves and their families. Our population here grows more diverse day by day. More than 129 languages are spoken in our schools. Immigrants are starting businesses that strengthen our local economy and bring the sights, sounds, and flavors of other countries to our Salt Lake community. They teach us about the tenacity of the human spirit and remind us not of how much we're different, but rather how we share a common humanity. Many, many distinguished speakers will follow me, and it's a humbling experience for me to be on this stage with them. Salt Lake County is proud to host the gathering of the Parliament of the World's Religions, and I know that you will receive the warmest hospitality that is a hallmark of this, the Rocky Mountain West. I extend my best wishes for a successful conference, along with my faith and my hope that the discussions that you hold over the next five days will ultimately lead to a more sustainable, compassionate, and peaceful world. Thank you. It has been a rich and full evening, 
And we thank you for your investment of time, which has not been insignificant. And we thank all of those who've come to speak. And just before our closing prayer, let me call upon Dr. Muhammad A. Siddiqui, who is the Professor Emeritus of Journalism and Public Relations at Western Illinois University, where he's taught for 29 years and is among the founding members of the World Council of Muslims for Interfaith Relations. Dr. Siddiqui. Good evening, Excellencies. Distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, sisters and brothers in peace from all over the world. On behalf of the program committee and the program staff, I welcome you all to the 2015 Parliament of the World's Religions. For the next four days, we will focus on the Parliament theme, reclaiming the heart of humanity, working together for a world of compassion, peace, justice, and sustainability by deliberating on the issues of poverty, hunger, and income inequality, war, violence, hate, and terrorism, climate change, and care for the earth. Multitude of religious and spiritual traditions from all over the world are represented at this parliament. Together, together we have convened one of the largest gatherings of the worldwide interfaith movement here in Salt Lake City. We all have the opportunity to interact, to engage, to connect, and to learn from each other. In our own faith traditions, we get a lot of opportunity for intra-faith understanding. Let us devote these four days for interfaith learning. And I would like to remind ourselves that the three guiding principles that we all must adhere to include respectful dialogue, which embodies listening and speaking with respect, non-proselytizing. We are not here to convert or to look down at other faith traditions. We are here to learn, to love, and to respect. and willingness to explore a wide variety of topics by being compassionate while engaging in difficult conversations. I would like to thank the members of the program committee, the program staff, and more than 20 evaluation committees for their hard work for almost a year to put together the program for this parliament. Please give all of them a big round of applause. We accepted more than 1,200 proposals out of the 2,000 plus that were submitted. I wish each presenter could have been given a full 90 minute slot. However, to accommodate these many programs and panels leading and panels, it was necessary to combine presentations, workshops, and panels leading to shared sessions. It's my humble request that when you are in those shared sessions, please be considerate to all the panelists and presenters so that everyone can get a fair amount of time. There will be two volunteers in each room, and if you have any problem with equipment, they are there to help you. Please recognize these many volunteers who are working hard 
to make our lives comfortable. Please consult the Parliament app for the latest updates on programs and rooms. Program staff is available at the very end of the registration desk. If you have any issue, please go there and consult with them. I would like to also announce that the Imam of the Grand Holy Mosque of Mecca is going to deliver his keynote address on Sunday during the climate change plenary, which starts at 3.30 p.m. <clears throat> the Imam is also going to lead the Friday congressional prayers at the Hilton Hotel Grand Ballroom tomorrow, starting at 1.15 p.m. Last but not the least, I thank each and every one of you for coming to attend the parliament. Especially, I want to extend my gratitude and thanks to all the presenters, performers, panelists, and workshop conductors. Will everyone who is presenting, can you stand for 10 seconds and be recognized? Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, let us make this parliament the most memorable event of our life. Meet, greet, smile, and say hello, hi, namaste, salam, shalom, as you pass one another. We may not know each other, but this is the largest family of spiritual and religious people who, have, who are gathered here in Salt Lake City. Enjoy every moment of your stay in Salt Lake and go back with even a stronger resolve that yes, indeed, the spiritual and religious people can make lives better and bring peace on this earth. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. And so it begins, dear friends, we, be, we launch our quest for a world of peace and justice in a spirit of compassion. We're so happy that you joined us. And we'll conclude this evening's activities and launch of the Parliament with a prayer by Dr. Anahat Sandhu who is a trustee of the Sikh Educational and Religious Foundation, as well as the Sikh Council for Interfaith Relations. Dr. Sandhu. I'd like to thank the board and the programming committee for having me, and the staff and all the volunteers for all the hard work they've done to put this together. It's my first parliament, and I have to say, it's inspiring to see so diverse a body as this parliament united in the common purpose of understanding. This prayer comes from Sukh Manisab. And Sukh is something this world sorely needs. Sukh has no direct translation, but it embodies peace, a sense of calm, contentment, well-being. This prayer is often taught to us as children, as one of the first we learn. It's short and it's humble. Tu thakur, tum pair das. Jio pen, sab teri ras. You are the master, we pray to you. Our body and soul, our all, our everything 
is your design. Tumat pita hambarak tere. You are the mother, father, we are your children. Tumri kripa mesuk genere. In your mercy, there is immense joy and comfort. Koinajane tumrayan. No one knows your bounds or limits. Uche te ucha pawan. You, God, are the highest of the high. Sagal smagri tumre sutartari. Everything is held in your control. Tumte hoi so agyakari. Your creation acts according to your will. Tumri gatmet tumhi jani. You alone know your extent, your attributes. Nanak das sada kurbani. Says Nanak, your servants are constantly amazed at your greatness. Vaheguru. Good night, dear friends, and we'll see you in the morning.